Hey friends, this is Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we discuss pop culture through the lens of race or gender, and sometimes both. I'm your host, Julia Washington, and on today's show, the duo from It's My Screen Time 2 is back, and we are talking about Annie. I'm excited you're here for Annie, the 1982 version, the OG, because I feel like I don't know. And we'll get into it, but I feel like this for anybody who was born in the era of Annie, this is like a defining musical for women over 35 everywhere. (laughs) Totally. So, yeah, so I'm going to dive in with the Google summary because we love to pull the summaries from Google because everybody Googles and whatever Google tells us, we tend to believe without question. So here's what Google has to say. An orphan in a facility run by the mean Miss Hannigan, Annie believes that her parents left her there by mistake. When a rich man named Oliver, air quotes, daddy Warbucks decides to let an orphan live at his home to promote his image. Annie is selected. While Annie gets accustomed to living in Warbucks mansion, she still longs to meet her parents. So Warbucks announces a search for them and a reward, which brings out many frauds. Okay. So this, like we said, this film debuted in 1982 and it stars Carol Brunette, who is the queen, Eileen Quinn, Tim Curry, and Bernadette Peters, and like so many others. So at the time of its release, the New York times had this to say, quote, Annie, which opens up today at Lowe's Astor Plaza and other theaters is a no expense spared tribute to the music hall and the kind of show business it represents. Though it's longer than most movies that played the music hall in its heyday, Annie is a nearly perfect music hall picture. It's big, colorful, slightly vulgar, occasionally boring, and full of talent, not always used to its limits. It's a movie in praise of waste space, end quote. (laughs) And then I watched the movie again after reading that because I was like, I'm going to find the reviews first, and then I'm going to read the reviews, and then I'm going to watch it because I want to pretend like it's 1982. So let's just start at the beginning. When did y'all first see Annie? Like, how old were you? And what were some of the things you loved about it? So I texted my mom to find out. And she thinks we saw it in the theater at Northland Mall Cinema in Worthington, Minnesota. I love that. I was only two when it came out. So I'm not sure when it came to Northland Mall Cinema. Um, But then this was also an era in time where my family would rent a VCR and VHS tapes Mm -hmm. from like an appliance store Mm -hmm. downtown. And I know we watched it at home too. And then the soundtrack was like the soundtrack to my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I feel like mine was only slightly later than yours in that I think it must have been one of those VHS tapes that you taped off of the TV and yes! it had the commercials in it. Yes. So it was probably like a couple years after you were renting the VCR. <laughs> oh my gosh, just a moment. Like, can we have a moment for renting VCRs? Like, that is such a quintessential, like, you knew you grew up in the 80s when. <laughs> that was what you did because vcr players were expensive (laughs) and they were big too can you imagine hauling like that giant piece of equipment home for the weekend so you can watch the movies it's kind of funny to think about it Uh, isn't it though especially now because it's like oh i'm gonna download paramount plus on my phone so i can watch stuff on the plane you know it's like right in your it fits in your pocket Mm -hmm. okay so let's get into some of the things you loved about the film well this movie and the musical movie version of Oliver were favorites of mine so I clearly loved the idea of an orphan being plucked from obscurity and meant for some greater destiny I feel like that's appealing to a lot of children I thought that Miss Hannigan was both terrifying and funny which made that whole situation perfect to integrate into make-believe play Mm -hmm. I feel like 90% of my make-believe play was based on Annie like making the stuffed dog Sandy and tying cans to its tail so that then you could take the cans off 
<laughs> or like climbing into the laundry basket and covering yourself with clothes so mm-hmm. you could sneak out of the orphanage like Annie did. Totally. Lots of dance numbers with buckets and brooms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I loved the makeover aspect of the movie like i love a makeover scene in a movie and so Mm -hmm. annie goes from like grungy orphan with those shabby curly hair pigtails in back to like beautifully coiffed child star looking person and i wanted to be one of the orphans when i was a kid because i loved the dance numbers so Mm -hmm. much and the just the boss dynamic of pepper in the Mm -hmm, bathroom mm -hmm. too yeah and then another scene that i really had forgotten about but in the rewatch i remembered i loved the radio commercial scene Mm -hmm. i wanted to be one of the are they the boiler sisters the boiling yes boiling sisters i wanted to be one of the boiling sisters when i was a child and i still kind of want to be one now yeah (laughs) So, Deborah, did you fight with your friends over who got to be Pepper when you were playing Annie? I don't remember that. I probably made my little brother be the (laughs) underling orphan so that I could be the bossy orphan. Oh, I love that. We always fought over who got to be the one who said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When that when that line hit, I was like, oh, that's a that's a very strong memory right there. (laughs) like that's what I live for um I think one of the things I loved about Annie was that and I didn't realize this until the rewatch was that they take a curly haired kid and leave her a curly haired kid because in (gasps) so yeah because in so often with makeovers when they have like this frizzy curly haired person because let's just be honest curly hair everyone says it's so beautiful but it's the actual worst some days um because it dries out really easy and the curls and all it's just so much maintenance and it's so much money and there's not enough time in the day before the work day begins to make that stuff look good before you have to be in an office Mm -hmm. but i love it so like we're so used to seeing these makeover films take these frizzy curly haired women and turn them into silky smooth beauties. And you're just like, okay, so the message I'm getting as a curly haired girl is that I shouldn't have curly hair anymore. But with Annie, they're like, we got you girl. Look at that curly red hair. It's so pretty. (laughs) That's a good point. As a very straight haired person, I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think definitely in this version of Annie, as opposed to later versions too, her curly hair looks credible. Yes. Like a lot of the later versions clearly have kids in wigs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you guys ever do musical theater in school? Have we ever had this conversation? I don't know, but my answer is emphatically yes. Yeah, yeah same. So did your schools ever do Annie? No. I was, yeah, yeah. I remember doing a dance number to It's a Hard Knock Life for mm-hmm, sure. Mm-hmm. Our Annie wig got a lot of play. And by the time like we actually did Annie, it was like, should we maybe, maybe replace that? <laughs> <laughs> it is not an attractive look on anybody in that wig right now. <laughs> the version of the wig that we had that got overused and not that redheads don't deserve attention and love. <laughs> That's the pre-makeover wig. Yes. And you just never switch it out afterwards. We just never switch it out. It's like there forever. <laughs> Use your imagination, everybody in the audience, because it's not a great production of Annie if it's done at my high school. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, any of my former classmates listening, um, which they aren't, which is fine. <laughs> Okay, so the premise of this movie is a little silly because we have this rich billionaire, billionaire in 1933. So that's like insane. Like we think billionaires are insane now. Like Mm -hmm. imagine when a loaf of bread was a nickel, wants to borrow a child for a week to improve his image. But this entire world, his entire world, everybody in his world falls in love with her so much that they beg him to keep her and to save her from this doomed fate. And honestly, in my opinion, it still works. So removing ourselves from our childhood viewings now as mothers, because we are all mothers in this room. Tell me about your adult feelings about this movie. Deborah, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to start with my the things I disliked. Okay. In the rewatch. I 
loved Punjab as a character when I was a child. Mm. I still think he is an incredible actor, but I mean, clearly problematic to have like this. I mean, it's Orientalism at its, it's like just a, such a great example of Orientalism and how yeah. uh, problematic that portrayal can be. I think it is like an indoctrination into capitalism mm -hmm. and it just like reinforces that here in America we have haves and we have have nots yeah and never the twain shall meet except if an orphan wins the orphan lottery yeah. right <laughs> mm -hmm. um so if I were to rewrite Annie I would have daddy warbucks redistribute his wealth which would be so anti-American nobody would ever pick pick that up um but the good things I really liked that I didn't appreciate as a child were like there's a scene where Miss Hannigan dumps her drink into the bathtub. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why is she dumping this drink out and wasting it? And then I realized the entire bathtub is filled with gin. Yeah. <laughs> which I didn't pick up on as a child. Right. <laughs> oh, and I mean, we're going to probably talk about Carol Burnett a little bit later, but she's just a true gem. Yeah. And I also loved like uh, Miss Hannigan's sexuality mm -hmm. because she's an old, she's, she's not old, but she's like not a young woman. And like this, I don't know, she's kind of portrayed as like a little bit desperate and needy, but she, it's, she still feels sort of empowered to me mm -hmm. because of the brilliant way that Burnett plays her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Katie? So those, those are some of my adult feelings. Yeah. <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> uh, I really have to agree with Deborah about the capitalism angle. I think it's super weird that Warbucks does not have any sort of redemption arc. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the movie, Annie and Warbucks are singing to one another, I don't need anything but you. They're doing an adorable tap dance number amidst a bizarre circus, yes. literal circus. <laughs> literal circus. Uh, but the truth is that Annie didn't prompt any sort of big change of heart in Warbucks. Mm -hmm. He only kept her because Grace, his secretary, asked him to, and he's in love with Grace. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted more of proof that Annie was melting Warbucks's heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also, because there was, there's this moment with President Roosevelt where Annie sings tomorrow, and Roosevelt kind of says, I thought you could run the New Deal, Daddy Warbucks. Yeah. And he never really says yes to that, but I could have used like a little montage at the end of mm -hmm. Warbucks like sweeping in and making reforms. Like, how about if he just stormed into the orphanage and like created public service reform and we saw like miss hannigan getting taken away in a paddy wagon or something yeah. like it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to add this like super heavy layer to this very fluffy musical but i would have liked to see warbucks change more than he did yeah he got he has villain vibes i felt like this time around and i don't remember being like thinking that when he was like when when I was a kid watching it I remember thinking gosh oh my gosh Annie's so lucky to be rescued from this horrible orphanage what isn't that every girl's dream to have a millionaire show up and buy you pretty things tells you the <laughs> state I was in at you know eight years old um but like he's just kind of like now that we live in a world where there is exorbitant wealth and like just really <laughs> insensitive billionaires you're mm -hmm. just kind of like okay daddy warbucks but like what no i can't with you and maybe don't touch grace please don't touch grace <laughs> i know she's, she's out of your league warbucks yes <laughs> i also like <clears throat> i like this whole idea of being rescued i'm really struggling with like that is a huge theme throughout a lot of disney stuff and i don't know if disney did annie did i watch it on disney plus or did i rent it they did a later version uh, with Kathy Bates and I think Victor Garber question mark. That feels <laughs> that feel, he feels like like being Daddy Warbucks, right? Like that feels like right. he, a role he could do. Um, I think I actually ended up renting it from 
the TV. But the, you know, but it's like, it's like this whole, like, I was like, okay, what's the context here? Okay. So it's 1933 ish. So I think we're still in prohibition. We're definitely in the throes of the depression. But Katie, you make a really good point. Like Daddy Warbucks doesn't really do anything to show that he's like becoming a man of the people. He just like brings these people. Like you see all the little girls and they're all clean and dressed pretty. And like, okay, so are you adopting like all of the girls from the orphanage? Like, is that a thing now? But like, also you don't care. Like you think Roosevelt's an idiot. Like you don't like, so there's a lot of things in adulthood where I'm just like, you have to really suspend your disbelief if you've never seen this in childhood and watch it as like a 40 something year old person. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to commit to your capitalist propaganda, like have a scene at the end where like Warbucks is like distributing these clean orphans to like his other wealthy friends right. or something. <laughs> like the rich people will swoop in and save society. Like fine, if that's the route you want to go, I guess. But yeah, it, he doesn't go either way. Nothing, nothing changes except they're all dressed nicely, and Miss Hannigan is riding an elephant at the end. Right, which also felt weird because I was like, wasn't she the bad guy? Like, isn't the bad guy, like, are we just channeling all of our bad guy consequences to Tim Curry then? Because, like, he's not the only bad guy in this movie. <laughs> like, yeah. the Hannigan is terrible to those children to the point where she's like, I don't care about you guys. And also, I'm going to go sleep with the laundry guy. Like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> But she draws the line at murder. So I guess in the end, she's a good guy. Oh, that's her redemption. She draws yeah. the line at murder. I mean, we I should hope we all draw the line at murder. <laughs> <Like, please. Right. laughs> Warbucks does have a line early on where he says, like, he loves money. He loves capitalism. Doesn't care about children. So maybe the fact that he adopts Annie is the redemption. And maybe there's, like, a Ooh. sequel in there where, like... You know how this is the happily ever after kind of it sort of ends in a marriage way. I don't want to yeah. say that there's any it's not creepy, but just like in a traditional ending of a musical or something. But then sure. maybe there's a sequel somewhere down the line where like that's when Annie really gives him a change of heart and he turns his palatial hmm. mansion over to all the orphans of the world. Yeah. Annie 2, a new deal. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for that, actually. I'm ready. <laughs> Bernadette Peters will reprise her role because I'm confident she can still sing and dance that way. For oh, sure. please. Tim Curry is not well, though, is he? He's I don't, he's Ill. I, I think, and I don't think he's been out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I haven't seen him promoting anything or going to anything. So I actually had to like make sure he was still alive because I was like, when's the last time we saw Tim Curry? You know, he was so cute. Like, I forgot how cute he was as a young man. It's like, look at mm -hmm. you. You're so adorable. Okay. So when I looked into Roger Ebert, cause you know, he was like literally the gold standard for the longest time. He had to say this about the film. And also I want to add, he only gave it three stars. Roger Ebert said, quote, will kids like this movie? Honestly, I don't know. When I was a kid, I didn't much like these like movies about other kids, maybe because I was jealous. The movie was promoted as a family entertainment, but was it really a family musical, even on the stage? I don't know. I think it was more of a product of a clever concoction of nostalgia, hard sell sentiment, small children, and cute dogs. This movie is the same mixture as before. It's like some kind of dumb toy that doesn't do anything or go anywhere, but it is fun to watch as it spins mindlessly around and around. End quote. <laughs> It's like I think he <laughs> hates joy. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> I was like, okay, thanks for being honest about being jealous. Like, clearly, you're not a generation where they made uh, kid content because we are. We're like the first generation of like this is clearly for children, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he's, you know, he clearly hates us for that. <laughs> I, I just, know, and I just to track back to our 
beginning of our conversation, I didn't grow up with a pocket computer that could play mu movies, but I don't begrudge children of today who have pocket computers right. that can play movies on airplanes. Right. Katie, what were you going to say? How can you even question this being a family film? It might be an early iteration of that, but like, yes, you have adorable dogs and singing orphans for the kitties. And you have all of this high level physical comedy and sexual innuendo coming from Carol Burnett, Tim Curry, Bernadette Peters. The kids aren't getting that as we already established. We did not get it growing up. Anything having to do with the depression. I'm not even really sure I knew what the depression was when I watched this. Like, right. it's clearly a film that's trying to work on multiple levels. Yeah. And we can talk about whether it's successful or not, but I don't think you can question at all whether it's a family musical. Right. I agree with you because like both of you watching it this time, I was like, oh, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't catch when I was a kid. And that's by design. Like that's good. Fam well, I'm not going to say good family entertainment, but that's what family entertainment does. Like when you go back and rewatch stuff from like, I don't know, Full House or I'm trying to think of other things where you're just like, oh my gosh, I totally didn't pick up on that. But now that I'm a parent, I get it. That's the whole point of family entertainment. There's something for everybody. Roger Ebert, where is your soul? <laughs> I know. I mean, I hate to speak ill of him. He was a luminary, but I think he got this one wrong. I agree. I, Sorry, go ahead, Katie. Oh, oh he, I mean, he Deborah. Wasn't he wasn't the only one who got it wrong. I looked at the IMDb profiles of some of the cast and the director john houston who i know as dad of angelica houston yeah <laughs> not as a famous movie director but there's a paragraph in the description of john houston's biography that says his only certifiable misfire was the elephantine mu elephantine musical version of annie though it later became somewhat of a cult favorite among children I think Gosh. just because like little girls liked it, it was uh, anathema to some of the movie critics of right. the time. To oh the my. issue of it being oversized, do you think there's a possibility that they cut out two, possibly three musical numbers in the version I watched and loved as a child that I taped from the TV? Because I swear I had never heard that song, We Got Annie. Or the one oh, really? where Buffs is like pushing Carol Burnett into the tub and making her sign. Like either my childhood self memory hold those or they cut it in the TV broadcast for length and I just never saw them. You That's know what? totally possible. Yeah, that is totally possible because when I watch, when I watched How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, it's usually on the TV. And then I had to cover it for another show. And I was like, what's this scene that I forgot about? Like, <laughs> right? this isn't on the TV. So that's totally, and especially back then, because they were really tight on time. Like, we've gotten so comfortable and used to the fact that shows can be like 42 minutes now or like 37 minutes or like 50, you know what I mean? Like a random number of minutes. But in our childhood, it was like, you have from 10, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m., no more, no less. And actually, you only have 42 minutes because of commercials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to say they maybe even faded out of the extra long Ruckus number. Yeah. <laughs> and just phased back in. Because that did last forever. That was a really long number. I actually did end up getting up to do something during that number. Because I was like, I feel like we're not going anywhere for a minute. I'm not going to miss anything. <laughs> Okay, they had a super long dance number with the Rockettes when they were at the movies, but that wasn't a movie, like, they were seeing it live, and then on top of that, they played large chunks of the actual movie they were watching. Yeah, that surprised me, because I was like, gosh, what were copyright laws in 20, in 1982, or in theory, like, 1981, that they could do this? It's well, Maybe it was, it was one of, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say they probably just pulled something from their vault. Yeah. But then they didn't have to pay. Yeah, that's a good point. What were you going to say, Deborah? I was going to say John Houston was very prolific. So maybe it was one of his earlier films. Because mm. the first movie he directed was in 1941. He had a very long career. Wow. 
Dang. Could you imagine having a career that spans like the, the like crazy technological advances from like the 1940s to the 1980s like that? I mean, we talk about like all of the advancements that we've experienced in our lifetime being kind of rapid fire. And so it's like, it feels strange sometimes to think about a world without cell phones because they came so quickly and they improved so fast and everything mm -hmm. about them makes our world move faster. But like, when you think about like what we were talking about earlier with renting the VHS player, like that was a huge technology advancement, being able to like rent a VHS or Betamax or whatever your family was into VHS mm -hmm. one. Um, but like in that 1940s to 19, like mid eighties period, like that's a huge Cha like you're still cutting film literally cutting film to make a movie mm -hmm. yeah amazing advances and still he had time to get married five different times oh, oh my goodness. gosh <laughs> i'm not john houston expert now i spent five minutes on IMDb. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it works that's, that's, what, that's the gift that the internet gives us uh -huh. <laughs> It's considered a deep dive when you read someone's IMDb page now. I learned that the other day and I was like, that's not a deep dive, but I'm not going to correct you because I want you to still be my friend. <laughs>
And it's like, so then of course, now that that's all in my head, I'm watching all of these kids and I'm thinking, what has happened and what is going on with all of these? Because there's a lot of children in this film. Not all of them have lines, but the dance numbers when they're in the orphanage, I, what is it's got, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I counted 20 kids at one point. Yeah. And the, the ones who sing have clearly trained voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that made, they're professionals. So, and it was like, I mean, there's a lot of talented kids these days, but I think the difference between like a 1982 talent and like a 2022 talent is that in 2022, that feels like what your parents are forcing you to do. And because we've had entertainment for so long and now mm -hmm. there is so much kid content that like you really are like being groomed for it. Whereas 40 plus years ago, you have these parents who are like, oh, my kid's kind of talented. Let's get you and sing it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but it just feels very different. Like the way that kids were trained back then compared to now, because the roles were so limited, you did have to like really stand out. Cause I, I don't watch kid content the way that I used to 10 years ago, but I had my niece was over one day and we were watching something that she loves. And I was like, this is trash. <laughs> like <laughs> this is actual garbage. And I switched to like, I think either full house or family ties. Cause like, I can't do it. This is not good. You need to see like good TV, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind yeah. of the premise of your guys' show. And I love it. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Katie, we ahead. are definitely living in the world of more. And when you have more of something, you obviously have to start, uh, employing people who might not be the best of the best mm -hmm. but I think back then I mean as long as there's been theater or movies there have been stage parents pushing their children into yeah. horrible situations so I think maybe the scenes are just showing now mm -hmm. more than they did yeah that's true and I think too like the the kids who are like you know the 35 to 45 range are starting to feel empowered to tell their truth about the situation that happened to them. Do you wonder what happens to those kids who were like, cause like none of the child actors in Annie, we don't recognize them. Right. You know, it's not like a Britney Spears or even a Jenny Lewis situation. Like, I wonder what happened to the, to the ones who had like a marginal level of success did they turn out okay? Mm -hmm. Did they leave the industry? Did they? Well, the story that else? you always hear that uh, is held up as like an example of how child stars can turn out normal is how the actor that played Charlie in the Gene Wilder version of Charlie and the Chocolate yeah. Factory grew up to become a dentist, right? I, yeah. I think that's correct. Um, yes. And that's held up as like a an example of oh look how wonderfully this guy turned out they they don't always have to be train wrecks and i wonder if that's actually the norm like the vast majority of people who appear as children even if they are in a lead role like they don't go on to have full careers in show business mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like that kid from hook and uh other movies that he did where he was super famous <laughs> And mm -hmm. from the early nineties, he's an attorney. I can his little face. <laughs> yeah. He's an attorney now. And he went to, you know, an elite private uh university. He went to an Ivy League and what have you. And he actually came sort of out of retirement, if you will, to do Can't Hardly Wait, which really is only eight years later after Hook, which is insane when you think about that. But it's it's just learning so much about like how little protection there is for kids when it comes to like the finances that the money that's earned, it really is kind of heartbreaking and gross because it's like, on the one hand, if you're the stage parent, it really is a full-time job taking your kids to auditions and being on set and all these things, because you can't work an eight to five to do that. No. But then on the other hand, the pressure to be the sole breadwinner for your family at like eight years old, that's insane. We would never expect that of a second grader in a normal circumstance. Well, if the state of child, of child actors in TV and movies makes you sad, let me just recommend that you don't look into YouTube. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, the pressure. I know. Cause it's a constant. Well, they're not protected at all because like child actors are at least protected by law in California, but like YouTube influencers are not. Yeah. And some States, like there are some States where 
directors choose to film because the protections of child actors are a little bit more lax. Oh. It's insane. It's so, it's so insane to me. So like I've modified the way that I write in case every, any, cause I'm so famous, such a famous writer, but like now I'm taking that into consideration when I'm writing my short fiction, because it's like, well, I don't want to like, if something ever got adapted, I do not want to be the person. I don't want to be associated with my work associated with that because that, I mean, Jeanette McCurdy's book, if you haven't read it, I mean, I want to say I recommend it, but it's also really like, it's a lot. Like after reading it, I was like, mom, can I come over and hug you? <laughs> like, oh. Thank you for making the bus cakes and making sure that we had like really fun birthday parties and that we got to be kids. Like, I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> you know I mean? Like, it was like this. And then on Pod Meets World, another actor, child actor was on Pod Meets World a week or two ago talking about her experience and like her mom turned her into an LLC, which circumvents the whole 15% has to go into this trust for kids. Oh, when you're no. a child actor. Mm -hmm. huh. I think she, I, I think she had to have been like 10 or 12 when her mom turned her into an LLC. That's really scary. Yes. <laughs> okay. Two things, Julia. One, I didn't know that you wrote short fiction. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. It's a lot do, of fun. It's a lot of fun. Do you link? Do you link to it on your website? Um, I don't. I haven't had anything published in a while because it, it it just feels like it's getting harder and harder to get published. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I do have linked on my profile is something that I had published when I was in grad school. Second thing I want to say is that if my dentist had played Charlie in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie, I could not get through a dental yes. exam without humming the Oompa Loompa theme song. Oh my gosh. I would get fired from that dentist office. Really strict <laughs> screening process to make sure he doesn't get harassed during teeth cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the questions is have you ever seen charlie in the chocolate or willy wonka and you're like no everyone lies on that question duh <laughs> okay sorry back to the question at hand let's talk about the stars tell me about your favorite scenes and what you appreciated about them now in adulthood that maybe you didn't when we were kids okay so tim curry right we've already talked about how attractive he is in this movie He's only like five years removed from the Rocky Horror Picture Show or something like that. It's I think not so. that much later. Yeah, because isn't Rocky Horror like 77? Yeah, 78? I want to say somewhere in the 75 to 77 range. Yeah. Uh, and it's like he cannot keep the Frankenfurter out of his rooster. Yeah. Like the, he does this little moment when he's opening the envelope to like find Annie's broken locket. Mm hmm. He's like doing a little strip tease with the yeah. envelope as he's opening it. And I'm like, stop it, Tim Curry. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. He did, I did think, oh, he's kind of making making this a little sexual. Like that was a thought I did have. Yeah. Okay, so I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought that. I loved Punjab, Jeffrey Holder. Did you get my link that I sent you to the seven up commercials from the 80s? Yes. Yeah. Also, this is totally appropriate. He narrated he narrated the 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie. I love that. Oh, <laughs> and he's got like a beautiful voice. I don't think he really speaks in Annie, but mm -mm, he's more of a beautiful voice. Looming presence that's terrifying. <laughs> Um, I also loved Anne Ryan King, who played Grace Farrell. I think she's incredible, mm -hmm. the dancing and the acting. And then I realized when I was rewatching it, I think that the actor and actress who play FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt are like who I actually think they look like. I don't yeah. think I could pick out actual fdr and eleanor roosevelt yeah. out of a lineup i think i would go to the actors yeah. i don't know what they really look like yeah oh, i love that so much <laughs> <laughs> and i noticed too they like elevated him in his wheelchair to a point where it looked like he might have been stand like he was so high up in his seating you know but i do love that that's so funny I do yeah, that and just Carol of Burnett appreciation. Mm -hmm. She's just so, so good. 
Is there this anyone better? Been, yeah. This has to have been where people of our generation encountered her. I think it's not so. as if we were watching her variety show growing up. Mm-mm. No, that was too early. Yeah. And then what TV show did she do? Because I know Vicki Lawrence did Mama's Family. And when I was a kid, I had a hard time separating the two of them because they felt like they did look so much alike. Um, and I think I she might have had guest appearances. I don't know. I'd have to double check. But there was a TV ad for Mad About You. And it's stuck in my head to this day. And the line was Carol Brunette and Carol O'Connor. Oh my goodness, is their marriage a goner? Because they <laughs> guest appearance at they do guest their guests on Mad About You as Jamie's parents. Oh, funny. So it was like it was fun to see. So that's gonna be in my head forever and ever and ever. <laughs> I tried so hard to get it out of my head. Good job to whoever uh, wrote that copy because it's still here, um, <laughs> <laughs> alive and well. Um, but I recently watched her Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. She oh. did an episode. It was really, really interesting. And she talks about how she got her start um, and like an anonymous benefactor. Like to this day, this man is clearly dead and she still won't name him because that was part of the stipulation. And then the other part of the stipulation was you also have to like return the kindness. So now I'm like, who did she support? Like, I need names. Like, give me a list. (laughs) That's interesting. I didn't know that. It's a really good episode. I don't know how PBS does their rewatching. I know they have a streaming app, but I think it, I don't know if you get it if you're a member or if you have to pay for it. Like, I don't know how that works. You do. I think if you support at any level, you get a passport membership. Oh, that's nice. That's good. See, because public television knows what's up. They're like, we love that you love us. So here's everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I also listened to her autobiography, I want to say like eight years ago now, and it was really lovely. So if anyone has more interest in Carol Burnett, that was a good listen. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts you want to add about Annie? It was really fun to revisit and just like such an instant gut punch punch of memory. Like mm-hmm. I didn't think I recalled this movie as vividly as I clearly did until I watched it again. So it was a really it was really a delight to revisit. Yeah. Ladies, can you tell our friends at home where they can find you if they want to keep up with you online? Sure. We have a new project called Spock Talk, and it is a true deep dive into the history of parenting advice and Dr. Benjamin Spock, the world famous pediatrician from the 20th century, who is like the ultimate parenting influencer of all time. So you can find us at www.spocktalk.com. And Katie, do you want to talk about our regular podcast? Yeah, so we still have our long-running podcast, It's My Screen Time 2, and you can find us at myscreentime2.com and at all the socials, but not TikTok. TikTok's a lot of work, man. I am in that (laughs) space, and there are days I'm just like, I can't today. I'm just going to scroll. There is no content for me to add because it's a lot. (laughs) I mean, I have a face for radio, so I just stay away from the video content. Oh my gosh. And friends, I will link everything in the show notes so you can find um, our pals and you can support their work too. I was listening to an old episode of Films to be Buried With and Hannah Waddingham was the guest. She talked about how the scene in the orphanage with Tim Curry, Bernadette Peters, and Carol Burnett made her want to be in Annie. I was beyond thrilled of her praise of that scene because when I watched it in preparation for this episode, I was in awe of how talented everyone is in that dance number. Going up and down the stairs while there's still a comedic element is brilliant. It's no surprise that these three have had such long lasting and amazing careers. If you haven't checked out It's My Screen Time 2, I was a guest a few times on their show and they are so much fun to talk to. I strongly encourage you to take a listen. Jelly Pop's happy hour is back. We gather to discuss current pop culture events over whatever beverage of choice you wish to bring to the virtual event. 
To get into that spiral of fun, you can join us on Patreon. If you join our studio audience, you get access to the happy hour. And the best part, you don't have to know anything about pop culture to hop in. It's also a fun way to support the show. Low pressure, maximum impact. We couldn't continue the show if it weren't for our Jelly Pops patrons. If you haven't checked out our sister podcast, Jelly Pops Book Club, and you are a bookish person or know a bookish person, then get into it. We are talking about book to screen adaptations over there. And sometimes we have guests and sometimes it's just me. And sometimes I talk about what I read and why I loved it or not. And sometimes we speculate on what would make a good screen adaptation and who we would cast to play those characters. With all the podcasts there are to choose from, thank you for choosing this one and continue Continuing to choose this one. If you love Annie and this episode, share it with a friend. If you want to talk about this episode, you can find me on Instagram or TikTok at the Julia Washington. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Until next time. <laughs>